You're listening to the Lore and Legend Valentine's Day special. Today, we have an original fairy tale, dreamt up by writer and Lore and Legend contributor Sarah Pearl, and interpreted and performed by me, Rick Scott. This is the tale of the Blue Rose. O Lord, what is this worldest bliss that changeth as the moon? One night, beneath the bright moon and a sky full of stars, a traveller was crossing the desert dunes when he came upon the ruins of a great palace. The sheer stone walls were crumbled down, exposing the great chamber to the dry wind and the shifting sands of the desert. At its heart crouched an imposing monolith of stone. Its features were worn down, eroded over the long ages by the lashing of the wind-blown sand. Yet still it was standing tall, looking up, toward the heavens, through the skeleton of a great dome roof that had long since fallen. The traveller reined in his horse, steered her in a wide circle around the plinth, and he gazed on the monument with wonder, trying in vain to discern the subject in the ravaged stone features. A voice said, it is Marinus. The unwise. Startled, the traveller swung his head. A stranger stood beside his horse, face hidden by the hood of a cloak of the deepest night blue. It's a great shame, they continued, that Marinus, being such a great king, but also its true and unwise one, is now forgotten. The stranger left his side and walked up to the great statue, climbed up onto the stone plinth. The traveller saw that whoever it was wore black silk gloves that covered them up to the elbow. The stranger said, Would you, traveller, like to hear the tale of Marinus the Unwise? And he said he very much desired to. Well, as I had told, King Marinus was a good man, but he was born into a corrupt and bloodthirsty family. In the rule of the kingdom, his parents, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, they all connived, conspired against each other, divided the kingdom up into factions, set families, towns and territories against each other. And when his father, the king, died, They all descended into a bloody and chaotic contest for the crown. At first, Marinus tried to play the peacemaker between his relatives, but in the end, he had to forge his peace by force of arms. And when the turmoil was all over, his kin lay at his feet, slain by his hand. As a child, they said that he had a gentle heart, but it was cool now. And when his counsellors said that he must choose a consort from amongst the noble sons and daughters of the land, he found this task more vexing than all the battles that had led up to that point. Each courtship was a kind of agony, and he broke off each in turn. He grew colder to the duty as the months wore on, If not for Rosalia, the kingdom may never have found a consort. Because one late evening, while walking in his gardens, the king came upon a woman who was studying the sky intently through the lens of a silver telescope. She didn't recognise him as the king. Marinus' private attire was plain and practical, never ornate. He was austere in his habits. 
He asked the woman what she gazed at so intently in the sky, and she held up the looking glass to his own eye. Do you see the moon and the stars? she asked him. I think they're the most beautiful things in all of creation. I could spend my whole life studying them. I believe I will. Marinus took the glass in his hands, and he looked, but not for long. He smiled as he returned it to her. Well, the superstitious say that the moon is fickle. The sun, it shines every day just the same, but the moon often leaves us in darkness, with sorrowful and evil nights. Why do you devote yourself to something so unconstant, and something that's always going to be out of reach? Well, how else would I learn to draw down the moon, she said. She looked into the telescope again. Her voice sounded wistful. The moon is our companion. It stands between the earth and the sky. She catches the starlight and reflects it to us. That is how, they say, the moon can be a bridge for souls and for spirits. They travel on her silver moonbeams. And in order to be a bridge, she has to be subject to the darker elements that exist here beneath the heavens. She has to sleep and wake, live each new day and die at the end of it, just like we do. It's a sacrifice. Well, Marinus said, I myself am just a humble gardener. I set my vision below the stars, I plant myself amongst rock and soil. I confess I find more life in the ripe bud of a rose than in the moon's pale mask. I don't look for my fate in far-flung flashes of starlight, but I sow and reap in my garden. While you speak as if sailors could cross the sea without the stars, or caravans find their way over the desert, like the sun didn't give life to all things, and that it doesn't decide when we sleep and when we rise, like the moon is not master of the tides. People think our hearts and our minds and our spirits can pass under them without feeling their pull. No, nothing that exists between the sphere of the earth and the sphere of the moon is perfect. Only the stars themselves are eternal. They're our guides. They are truth tellers. Their laws can't be broken. Well, Marinus laughed. <laughs> when I was born, the stargazers said that I would be a madman. And yet I think I am the only member of my family that was ever truly sane. The stars revealed to my father that I would live a short life, she said. But the philosophers say our souls are born from the stars, so they must be eternal as well. Perhaps the end of one life is only the beginning of another. Do you really believe that? he asked. I believe that you are not a gardener she said. And Marinus hid his smile. Then he took the telescope from her and he began to back away. Well, it's an awful thing, but it appears that some rogue has stolen your telescope. The woman gazed back at him narrowly. Then it seems I'll have to return here tomorrow night and hope the thief's guilty conscience compels him to return it. Well, Marinus left her, but he returned the next night, and any night that he could after that, to find the stargazer and to converse with her. He learned that her name was Rosalia, that she was an astronomer of the royal court in the palace. And, he learned, promised since youth to the steward of his royal court. Well, when almost twelve months had passed without Marinus choosing a consort, he summoned the steward to see him. Your loyalty, the king said, has been recognised, and you deserve to be rewarded. You will be a wealthy man. You shall be dressed in fine robes and wear precious jewels on your fingers. You shall have a carriage and pages to bear you through the streets. You'll dine on the choicest foods. I'm going to make you an adventurer in foreign lands, a captain at the head of our legions, and a mercenary 
in the foreign courts of kings. He promised him all this. The only thing that was required was that he sever any ties that might bind him to the court here in the kingdom. Any debts, any pledges, any promises that might hold him down. And there wasn't any hesitation. The steward said that for this advancement, he would abjure all. Well, when Rosalia learned that the king had dissolved her espousal, she was enraged. She demanded admittance to the court. But when the king did admit her, she was brought up short. For coming face to face with her sovereign for the first time, the last thing that she had expected was to look up and see, gazing down at her from the seat of power, the face of her companion from the palace gardens. She was dismayed, and yet she did not falter. She demanded reparation for her broken engagement, which had so damaged her position, her prospects and her security. The king listened to her demands. He expressed his regret, his sorrow for the distress that he put her in. You're right, of course you are. Since you've been deprived of your prospects, the breach must be repaired. A new engagement must be arranged. Tell me, will you consent instead to be my own wife? There were gasps all around. Shocked silence settled on the court. Rosalia glanced around at the crowds of courtiers. My liege, she said, I hardly know whether someone like myself has the liberty to refuse. Well, the shocked silence deepened. Marinus himself was speechless. He turned quickly away. He muttered to his page, leave us. And the whole court of the king emptied with great haste. Marinus spoke quietly. But for you, he said, I had fought love to be forever out of my reach. It was you who showed me it might be possible for a man to draw down the moon. And with that he made to leave her. But before he could go, she stayed him with an outstretched hand. And she said quietly, I do not love Marinus, sovereign of the air and sea and land, commander of armies, defender of the people's faith. That man's a stranger to me, and so is the world that he lives in. But the man I met in the garden, I do love him. Marinus turned, and Rosalia placed a hand on his chest. For him, perhaps I could leave everything I know behind. Even though, if you take my hand, do you feel how it shakes? O oh, more than moon, draw not up seas to drown me in thy sphere. Weep me not dead in thine arms, but forbear to teach the sea what it may do too soon. Let not the wind example find to do me more harm than it purposeth, since thou and I sigh one another's breath. Whoever sighs most is cruelest, and hastes the other's death. Well, as a queen, Rosalia was loved by all who respected wisdom and kindness. And Marinus, he knew the kind of contentment which he had always counted a fairy tale, something for foolish children, not for a man like himself. And the gardens, they were still their place of refuge, 
where king and queen could become plain souls, just a man and a woman who had met one night underneath the stars. But as is always the way in tales such as ours, this happiness could not last. They shared two long and joyful summers together, and then Queen Rosalia one day grew sick. No physician could revive her fast weakening body. Marinus, never leaving her side, watched in desperation as she slipped gradually away from him. And he was there at her side when Rosalia took her last breath. The king was consumed with grief. He let no one approach the body, sealed Rosalia away in her chamber, didn't allow priests or family to see her, drove everyone away from those floors of the palace. From outside the doors, day and night, the only thing that could be heard were the king's broken sobs and laments. At length all gave up and withdrew and the long restless conspirators and faction chiefs of the court began to sharpen their knives. Then one night, the king did summon one of his royal agents, and through a crack in the door he gave hoarse commands. Bring him someone who knew the secrets of how to snatch back souls from the cusp of the moon. Bring to him a necromancer. And so a stranger was brought from outside the city walls, a man whom all avoided wherever he walked, for he was cursed. He stood on the threshold of the palace gate, he was ushered inside, brought to the dim chamber, where Marinus crouched silently in the shadows, keeping vigil over his wife's deathbed. Tell me, the king said, can you bring her back to me? The necromancer answered, there are powers that can bring her back, but the cost to you, to her, to the kingdom cannot be reckoned. This is not a thing asked lightly. Marinus never looked at the necromancer, but gazed only on Rosalia's still face. And then he said, Call them. And so the necromancer stood on the eastmost tower, and he spoke the words of summoning, and the winds carried his words over the land, across the horizon to the farthest corners of the desert. His words were carried, and they were heard. King had not eaten or drank for days. He had not changed his robes since Rosalia left him, and he was clasping her cold fingers still in his own when the spirit entered. The torches flared and dimmed as the shadow filled up the corners and the deep spaces of the chamber. All at once the air was filled with the wailing of the wild wastes, the cries of the lost and the wayfaring. Who calls? The spirit demanded. And he said, I am Marinus, the king. The spirit said, What is your desire? Marinus the king. And Marinus said he desired soul magic, magic which would restore his queen to life. What you ask is possible, the spirit said, for 
for I am a jinn of great power and potency. But you must heed my commands. Marinus, he assented to obey the jinn in anything. And then the jinn began to sing a mysterious melody, a haunting tone, words which whelmed in the air like thick perfume. As the jinn sang, the queen's chest began to rise, as if the lungs were filling themselves once again with life-giving breath. But as the body appeared ready to exhale, Marinus saw the shoot of a green stalk sprout suddenly from between his wife's lips. It curled upwards into the air, then swelled instantly into a fresh green bud. Moments later, the bud had opened, unfurling a glorious halo of Asia blue rose petals. The rose gave off a supremely sweet scent, a sweetness which spread itself throughout the whole chamber, chased away the stench of death that clung in the air. The king watched, entranced, as the rose flowered into being. The petals were vivid and lustrous, the stamens glittered like bright gold. The blue rose had an unmistakable radiance, a resonant aura, and it hummed in the air. Marinus reached out to take it. Hold! The spirit's voice struck like lightning against the mountainside. Once the rose is plucked, the seed of her soul will be in your hands. Whoever touches the flower, they shall take the seed inside them, and in their body, Rosalia shall be reborn. But you yourself must never touch the flower, nor must you ever touch her after she has returned. Heed my words, anything else will spell your doom. Marinus nodded. He thanked the jinn and told him to carry away as much treasure as he desired from the vaults of the palace. And when the jinn had departed with his prize, Marinus, being careful not to touch the flower, picked the rose from between his dead wife's lips. He then had the body taken away, the bed removed, and where it had stood, he placed the blue rose on a plinth, underneath a glass bell jar, and then he had the doors sealed. The man who emerged into the palace was not the grieving madman that the court expected, but neither was he quite the king that they remembered, for he moved and he spoke with his former authority, his every action and word was infused with a feverish intensity. Marinus called the court, he announced that for the stability and continuity of the realm he would remarry at once. All his counsellors and the noble families should prepare their former and newfound candidates for marriage. His immersaries should send for foreign princesses and princes. For King Marinus was seeking a consort. My face in thine eye, thine in mine appears, and true plain hearts do in the faces rest. So went out the call, and so they came, 
a procession of suitors, even longer now that Marinus was pressing the search himself. One after the other, the sons and daughters of the noble houses within and without the kingdom's borders were presented. Marinus scrutinised them all. He made thorough examination of them. But he was plagued by questions. Was this body sound? Was it whole? Was it fated? What if the flesh was weak like her first? If he made the wrong choice, what kind of agony might he buy for his wife? What would she feel when she looked in the mirror and saw this face? Or that one? What would he feel? But in each case, whatever their particular powers or qualities, they were not Rosalia. He tried to imagine Rosalia looking out at him from behind their eyes. But it was impossible. It would not be her face, her smile, her laugh. And how could it be? Meanwhile, the blue rose did not maintain its first vitality, but with each passing day, the luster of its petals faded, began to wilt, began to turn brown at the edges. Marinus intensified his search, casting his net wider. Not just high-born lords and ladies, but the sons and daughters of petty nobles, merchants, farmers. For that, many judged him to truly have lost his senses. But it was all to no avail. Whomever he met, he was possessed with an anguished certainty. Rosalia could find no home there in that body body and a soul, after all, are made for each other. Once she was joined to this one, who would she be then? What mark would this body make on her soul? Would she be the same? Or would she be different? Was he giving her back a future? Or would changing her body change her fate? And what is our fate but a heart grown into its final shape? You see, no matter who they were or what they were willing to give, none of them were a perfect slate. They brought with them the, the taste of their lives, the smoke of their passions, the embers of their memories. They lingered surely in the threads of the flesh, in the furnace of the heart, a silt, a residue, a texture, whether it was subtle or crude. Thoughts like this would run unruly through his mind every night as he sat in the Queen's chamber, contemplating the blue rose and the shafts of moonlight that shone through the window into the tower. The moon showing its changing faces, waxing, waning, dying and returning. There was time, he told himself. The djinn had given them time. But whomever was presented, he found some fault, some flaw, some shadow of doubt, a suspicion that they were unworthy of his beloved. The king delayed. The rose wilted, the flower's head drooped lower beneath the bell glass, the cold, the warm blush of blue was almost gone from the petals. Time was running like sand through Marinus's fingers. Rosalia's soul was dying. On the final day of the king's search, a young man of exceeding beauty was brought before him, exquisite in manner, demeanour and energy. He had heard all the stories about King Marinus, the tragic death of his wife, 
and he'd heard other things as well. Rumours of despair, of madness, of witchcraft and sorcery. But when he was presented, he smiled and he said, King Marinus, I confess, not everyone who knows what I know would have the courage to stand here before you now and offer to give themselves into your power, body and soul. But do not doubt, but believe me when I say, I am ready to surrender everything, even my very soul. For by it I hope to secure the lives, the loves and fortunes of all whom I love and hold dear in this world. I would consider it worthwhile. I would consider it a worthy sacrifice. Marinus circled the stranger, hungrily, placing his hands on his shoulders, taking his pulse, looking into him at the eyes. He was handsome, he was healthy, evidently sharp in his senses, and strong in his mind as well, despite his strange words. When Marinus looked into those eyes, he saw something in the prince that he had not seen in any other. Knowledge. Determination. Acceptance. But... Still... Still... No. Marinus couldn't. He simply could not. He spun about. He pressed his head into his hands and then with a strangled cry of frustration, he ran out of the courtroom. He flew to the chamber where he kept the blue rose. He flung open the doors. Moonlight streamed in through the tower window. And there, framed in the beams of light, he saw his wife, Rosalia, bending over the pedestal, reaching out a luminous palm to touch the flower, the flower on which the petals had shriveled, sinking even now towards the ground under its own weight. Rosalia glanced up at him, imploringly. She seemed to mouth his name, Marinus. His eyes widened. He cried out as he leapt towards her. The bell glass shattered on the stone floor. He seized the rose. Its dying fragrance filled his nostrils as he drew it close, and very tenderly pressed the flower to his lips. Call her one, me another fly. We are tapers too, and at our own cost die. And we in us find the eagle and the dove. When his courtiers found him, hours later, the king was laid out on the floor of the queen's bedchamber. At once they began to panic. Nobody knew what to do. Marinus had no heir. He'd left no instructions. His body was moved to his own bedroom, where the men of the court pressed around him anxiously. Was he truly dead or merely sleeping? The whole palace rapidly began to descend into turmoil. But some hours later, Marinus did open his eyes. The courtiers gasped. Your majesty, they said. Your majesty, oh, thank God you're still alive. Everyone was fearing the worst. Here, drink this water, eat this food, and tell us how do you feel? But Marinus answered. I am fine. I, I feel quite well, although I feel like I've slept. For an eternity. Now, all of you, kindly tell me, where is my husband?
or the stranger's tale was finished. The sands were shifting around their feet in the feet of the great statue. The stranger still was perched on the stone and he saw that she had blue eyes that shone as they caught the moonlight. The traveller shivered. What happened then? he asked. Well then, Rosalia ruled the kingdom for many years in the body of her husband, though she grieved always for his absence. Her rule was wise and just and she left a powerful legacy, begetting many sons and daughters that continued the line of Marinus. But all kingdoms fall, eventually. Cities are lost beneath the dunes. Peoples flower and they fade. If they're lucky, they give their seed and their spirit to a new generation. All things change and all things fade. Yet some things still are imperishable. At least there is someone yet to remember Marinus the unwise. Then the stranger turned her face from the moon to the traveller's own. Now, she said, you know the story. But will you carry the memory next? If you are willing, take it from me. I offer it to you, take it as a kiss from my lips. Entranced as he was by the beauty of the stranger's eyes, the traveller found himself leaning towards her. As he did, she slipped the long black silk gloves down her elbow and over her wrists. Their lips met and as they did, her mouth opened imperceptibly. Then she fell. The traveller caught her and lowered her gently towards the ground. There the traveller left her by the feet of the great monolith. The traveller mounted their horse, turned about, to look one last time upon the cracked face of the great King Marinus. The traveller raised a hand in parting and whispered, Farewell, my King. This episode of Lore and Legend comes to you thanks to the contributions of our Patreon subscribers, Storyfolk Christy Carson and Paul Jackson. Thanks to them for their generosity and their enthusiasm for our stories. The music featured in this episode includes the Lore and Legend themes by Robert Bentel and the Morning of the Roses and tracks from the albums Kenunos and Muse 5 by composer Caleb Hennessy. Thanks to Caleb for allowing us to feature his music. You can find more of Caleb's work by searching for Caleb Hennessy, composer, on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube and Spotify, or by following the links to his social media profiles in our episode notes and blog post. The rest of the audio work and sound effects were sourced from the community at freesound.org and full audio credits can be found on our website. Verses from traditional folk ballad The Nut Brown Maid and from the poetry of John Donne were read 
by me, Rick Scott. You've been listening to the law and legend Valentine's Day special, The Blue Rose. Your storyteller today was Rick Scott, and the tale maker was Sarah Pearl. For news about upcoming episodes and more info about our stories and their sources in world folklore, find us at www.lawandlegend.co.uk or follow us on Facebook and Twitter at of Law and Legend. If you like what you've heard and you'd like to hear more, please consider joining Christy and Paul in supporting the podcast by becoming a patron. For more details, visit our website and click support us or go directly to our Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash law and legend. Listener support gives financial fuel to our productions, ensures that we can continue to make the best quality content for the podcast and get it out to more people. It contributes directly to maintaining our website, expanding our audience, and improving the quality of music and sound for each of our episodes. Other ways of supporting us include making a one-time donation for one of our bonus episodes, available from Gumroad through the Law and Legend website. You can also listen to us on the sponsored Radio Public app, and spread the word about Law and Legend by sharing our episodes with your friends and followers on social media. You can find out more info about all of this and lots more on our website at www.lawandlegend.co.uk. Thank you for listening, Storyfolk. <laughs>